Your Excellency, Professor Minister Bambang Burji Nagoro, um, Your Excellency and the moderator, Ms. Yanchen Sogyal, and ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome. I'd like to introduce the seminar series and our moderator. His Majesty's Royal Kasho on Civil Service Reform observes our future will become invariably interwoven with the fusion of ideas, innovations, and technologies, which are taking place at a very fast pace. Inspired by the Royal Kasho and other discourses that refer to artificial intelligence, deep learning, and futuristic digital technologies, as well as by innovations from, from Bhutan, from Druk Trace to Digital Drukil, the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies is hosting this seminar series on the use of artificial intelligence and innovative solutions to support ethical and good governance. Eminent speakers around the globe from policy and from academia will share the positive roles that technology and artificial intelligence can play. So listeners ponder how and whether these might advance GNH across Bhutan. Will Bhutan use drones to monitor forests and rare species, improve crop yields, or survey land? How will remote schools and clinics connect? Will AI unblock people's traffic jams, verify civil servant working hours, and process citizen feedback? Will the new wave of tourists be greeted by a Kira wearing chat box? And at the scan of a QR code, learn about a temple and the great masters that taught there in their language. And importantly, what dangers can be avoided so new technologies do not cut jobs, uproot faith, splinter equity, create alienation, or weaken social connections. Please check the CBS website or Facebook for details of upcoming talks on these and other topics, and be sure to register so you can join by Zoom where you have the opportunity to interact directly. All seminars will be archived so they can be viewed asynchronously from the CBS sites. A pivotal part of these seminars is their moderation. His Majesty's Kasho said, our people's sense of identity and belonging to national community will matter even more to enable them to navigate through the complexity and sophistication of the future. Session moderators will help us ponder how international experiences are relevant to our own identities and contexts. Therefore, I am delighted to introduce our moderator for the session, who will in turn introduce our keynote speaker. Our moderator, Ms. Yang Chen Sogil, has served for five years as Deputy Governor of the Royal Monetary Authority, looking after monetary policy. She has also served as part of His Majesty's Relief Kidu, providing timely and immediate relief for people who have lost their livelihoods as a result of the pandemic. She was invited to moderate this very visible opening session because of her penetrating understanding of the interplay between technology, policy, and governance. Previously, Ms. Yan Chen directed the RMA's Research and Statistics Department. So like our speaker, her background spans both research and policy. She holds a master's degree in public policy from Australian National University in Canberra. Over to you, Ms. Yanchen. Thank you, Sabina. Welcome to the first Shijenkar virtual seminar initiative on the use of artificial intelligence and innovative solutions to support ethical and good governance, organized by the Center for Bhutan and GNH Studies. I'm very honored to be moderating the inaugural seminar under this important and exciting theme. Today's seminar will look at the role of digital technologies in automating the civil service procedures. We are joined today by viewers from Bhutan, from different locations in Bhutan, as well as viewers from Indonesia. The seminar is also being live streamed on Facebook. Uh, uh, we are very honored to have our keynote speaker with us who will be available for the next one hour. Uh, if you do wish to have a more interactive session, I would encourage you to join via Zoom. Otherwise, you can also leave comments on Facebook, which we will be monitoring. It is my privilege to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker who will open the series, 
His Excellency, Professor Bambang Rojonegoro, Minister of Research and Technology and Head of the National Research and Innovation Agency of the Republic of Indonesia. Professor Brojo Negoro will share his experience in implementing civil service digital portals in Indonesia, which aims to increase the efficiency of government services through the use of AI and technological tools. Professor Brojo Negoro is an economist currently serving as the Minister of Research and Technology. Professor previously also served as the Minister of National Development Planning and as the Finance Minister. As Minister of National Development Planning, Professor supported Indonesia's development planning, financing, and economic stabilization. In the Ministry of Research and Technology, Professor has worked on many projects supporting the improvement of civil service delivery programs, the forming of digital portals, and solutions for management of climate change and biodiversity in Indonesia. His Excellency is in fact leading the drive to digitalize the government of Indonesia. Professor also actively participates in numerous local and international organizations, as well as several Indonesian companies, either as director or commissioner. He started his career as an academic at the University of Indonesia Faculty of Economics and Business, assuming various roles of lecturer, researcher, and the faculty dean. His leadership experiences in international and government institutions, as well as organizational and academic roles, have shaped his career and afforded him various essential soft skills which are beneficial for the Republic of Indonesia. He has a strong commitment to establishing good governance and focusing on the rural poor in line with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Your Excellency, I would like to inform you that we in Bhutan are also on the cusp of transformative change guided by the wisdom and foresight of our King, His Majesty, who is a champion of technological change and innovation and has called for comprehensive and bold reforms of both our civil service and our education by leveraging on the exciting technological potentials of the 21st century. This push for reform is driven by His Majesty's vision, and here I refer to the Royal Kasho on civil service reform. To repeat, the push for reform is driven by His Majesty's vision to build an unshakable foundation for a vibrant democracy, create the material conditions for realizing gross national happiness, and further strengthening our peace and security. Your Excellency, may I also inform you that we have recently embarked on a very exciting national digital identity project a personal initiative of His Majesty's, which will pave the way for a digital Bhutan. Today's seminar is very timely, and we are very honored and also grateful to Your Excellency for taking time to inaugurate this inaugural, uh, inaugurate the first seminar. And we look forward to learning from Your Excellency's experiences from Indonesia. With this, uh, may I welcome Your Excellency and request you to address the audience today. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, very good afternoon, uh, everybody. The representative of Kingdom of Bhutan and also uh, Professor Sabin al -Khair from Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative, uh, distinguished government uh, officials, representative, participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation uh, from uh, both uh, Kingdom of Bhutan as well as Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative to discuss 
about uh, good governance in digital era. This is the title that I think will be very much relevant uh, for the future. So if I can share the screen, uh, in the case of Indonesia, of course, uh, we would like to do the same by promoting the good governance in digital era. And of course, the digitalization in Indonesia becomes much more relevant because we are a very big country with 270 million population with domination of younger population. And we have the vision as well. Our vision in 2045, when we celebrate 100 years of our independence, Indonesia could exit the middle income trap or could get out of middle income trap. And of course, 2045 is about 24 years from now. And currently, we are still in the upper middle income countries. And our gross national income per capita is now around 4,000 US dollar, while the threshold to become high income country is more than 13,000 US dollar. So of course, we have to do a lot of effort to be part of very few countries that have been able to get out of middle income trap. And one uh, extra effort that we have to do is to promote the good governance. And of course, economic growth is one thing. Yeah. And the, the way to promote innovation is a strong instrument to achieve this development goal of being a developed economy by 2045. But the foundation for all of that, the foundation for innovation-driven economy, the foundation for strong economic growth in the period of 24 years must be the good governance itself. But at the same time, we are in the era of industrial revolution 4.0, meaning the way we implement good governance cannot be the same with the way we implemented good governance in the last 10 years or last 20 years. Things have to be different. And of course, we have to do special efforts in making sure that we are in line with the era of industrial revolution 4.0. That's why from government point of view, Indonesia needs to create the smart government architecture. To the next page, please. Yeah. In the Indonesia smart government architecture, of course, the goal is to create you know, smart government in terms of administration. Certainly, if we can do much more, if we can do more efficient in administration, that will help the governance itself. So government administration, public service, you know, public service has to be more accountable, has to be more transparent, and more importantly, has to, has to have higher quality. And then it will include a multi-stakeholder that has their own data. So the transaction, data transaction, data interaction will be uh, one of our goal, aside from the macroeconomics perspective. And also, don't forget the smart city. Maybe people think that you know urban area is not that special. But for many countries, especially in the future, urban areas will become quite special because that's the place where people, uh, where there is a high concentration of people living in the same area. So on, on those areas, we really need to implement this smart government. Again, government administration, public service, multi-stakeholder data transaction, smart city, and the macroeconomics. In order to support that, we need to create various platforms. And the various platform, of course, aside from big data and artificial intelligence, fintech, mobile uh, device, yeah, everything has to be everything has to be done through the mobile technology, 
as well as of course for country like Indonesia, geospatial aspect, and don't forget interoperability. Sometimes in the government, the hard the hardest thing to do is to do is to coordinate, to do coordination. And part of the difficulty in doing coordination is lack of interoperability on data. So sometimes the data from Ministry A cannot be used by the Ministry B, simply because the data in Ministry A and Ministry B are not interoperability. So whenever you obtain the data from other ministry, you have to basically reformulate the data, which takes time, and of course, it is far from efficient. And then another platform to push for e-government is electronic signature. There are still problems in many developing countries in which the signature has to be a real signature using the pen. And of course, it was the old days. In the future, we need to promote electronic signature as a formal signature. So it doesn't have to really use the you know, traditional pen, but instead we use the computer. We use the, the online system in order to make sure electronic signature will be formal. And to help decision making decision making process, of course, you have the platform in terms of dashboard. So dashboard will be like the standard for future government office. So any decision making doesn't have to, you know, you call for meeting repeatedly, you obtain the data from every officials, but instead, all the data should be uh, collected, analyzed, and presented in a dashboard. And then it has to be real time. So whenever you want to make decision, you know that all the, the inputs to make decision is all available in your dashboard. So of course you can be minister of finance. When I was a financial minister, I used the dashboard to monitor how much tax revenue coming today, how much government spending in education, how much government spending in health, how much government spending for infrastructure, for example, how much the, the debt of the government. So everything will be in one dashboard, one decision support system, and it's up to you to make decision based on the, the, the data contained in the dashboard. So you can imagine there are many platforms you have to formulate in order to support the application of the e-government or the electronic government. And of course, uh, aside from the, the application side, you have to pay attention to the basic infrastructure. And that basic infrastructure will be, number one is cloud computing. Of course, now there is no uh, story about the limitation of memory in your computer. It's no longer an issue. Cloud computing is the answer. You can store as much data as possible in your cloud computing. But of course, you need to build the infrastructure in terms of national data center, the sectoral data center, and of course, uh, in the case of country like Indonesia, regional data center. So everything will be under the data center, and then you can uh, search, you can uh, organize the data based on your needs. And then uh, aside from the, the storage system, you have to make sure that you have good connectivity, the intra-government network. So of course, broadband will be, you know, has to be at the maximum, you know, the, the biggest broadband that you can have, the fastest wireless system that you can, you can get, of course, now we are talking 4G, but soon everybody will have to use 5G. And maybe after that, you have to be ready for 6G, 7G, and so on. So basically, the speed and uh, uh, basically the speed is the key for the network. Plus, of course, the quality of the internet itself. And of course, you need to. Uh, 
you need to appoint some agencies that will be uh, dealing with this uh, smart government architecture. One of them could be the statistical bureau, statistical uh, agency. Another could be like Ministry of Finance because they deal a lot with the financial data. And the other could be ministry related to government administration or my, my ministry, ministry related to research and technology. So the agency has to work together in order to create and to provide good government network, big uh, storage system through cloud computing, and provide various platform that will be useful for many applications that will be priority for the government. And then the uh, Indonesian government already issued presidential decree in 2018 about e-government. So it means e-government has to be the mainstream in the near future. Of course, now is still time for preparation. As you can see on the right side, from 2018, which is the when the decree was issued, until 2022, which is next year, we are, st we are still in the stage of preparation. Preparation for the e-government by developing the architecture, strengthening the, the coordination team, especially among different levels of governments, developing public service portals, government administration, and national data portal, and integrating, which is very difficult because I was finance minister and I know difficulties in integrating planning, budgeting, procurement, and also accountability, plus the staffing, archiving, and public complaints. Basically, we are trying to integrate so many systems under one roof, and that's not easy, but it has to be done as a, in the stage of preparation. After that, from 2023 up to 2025, we hope that the e-government has been developed by developing the e-government service portal based on no longer just data collection, but already based on AI and big data. So this is the time in which government of Indonesia has to implement fully the Industrial Revolution 4.0. So the government will do or will, will base their activities not only on you know, service of their employees, but also based on AI and big data. And then, of course, we have to secure broadband and intergovernmental network development, application of security, information security. Once you have you know, uh, e-government system, next thing that you have to worry is the security. Because once the security is very weak, then there is a bridge to the system. And of course, the data could be wide open. And of course, there is a potential of chaos. So that's why information security has to be at the top of the priority before you can really launch your e-government system. And of course, part of that, you have to pay attention to the capacity building for human resources. So with this, this kind of uh, plan, we hope that uh, we can develop a shared national digital ecosystem by util utilizing demographic service system for education, health, medium, small enterprise, and also for employment. And then developing integrated education system, especially for distance learning and pre-employment services like training. And then development, developing integrated financial transaction system for administrative purposes and public services. In Indonesia, for example, today, we already started some pilots on what we call the electronic uh, traffic fine. Previously, if you violate any uh, regulation you know, on the road, you, you can get the fine. And the fine will be done basically very physical. You have to pay cash or you have to go to the police office and then you uh, pay uh, your fine. But now they use the what they call e-fine, electronic fine. And the way they do electronic fine, traffic fine, is using the camera. Once the camera capture, for example, your car is speeding, then maybe in two or three days, 
there will be a letter coming from the police station to your office saying that your car at certain time, certain day, violating the speed limit. And as a result, you have to transfer, let's say, a certain amount of money to the uh, police uh, office. So this is the start of how we can uh, promote the e-government using this kind of integrated financial transaction. So it's not just services, it's not just uh, ops, I mean, uh, uh, law enforcement, but law enforcement plus the fine that can be done in the electronic way. So this uh, e, uh, electronic uh, traffic fine is uh, a good example of promoting the e-government for the people. And of course, before you move into building the e-government system, you need to have consistency on data. And we have to admit in Indonesia, you know, although we have, uh, we just celebrated uh, 75 years of our independence, data consistency are still a big problem. Even one ministry to the other, sometimes they have same variable of data, but with different information. So that's why sometimes we have problem to analyze whether we have to import rice or not, simply because the data of rice production could be different from Ministry of Agriculture and the National Agency of Statistics. So the government is confused. Uh, Minister of Trade has to make decision whether to import or not. Because if we have enough production, we don't have to import. But if the data shows that our production is low, then we have to import in order to avoid the inflation. So this is the example how important the consistency of data. Uh, that's why in 2019, uh, our president issued a degree about one data. And the one data will support, of course, open government Indonesia. And the way uh, one data works is basically trying to uh, improve data governance, you know, by regulatory and institutional arrangement, standardization and data synchronization to make sure all the data are consistent and synchronized, capacity building of uh, getting the data itself, and the, the thing that always happens in many developing countries, especially Indonesia, ensuring that data interoperability across ministries. And I had a very good experience about lack of interoperability. So when I was finance, uh, sorry, when I was minister of for planning, I need to get the data, the budget data, to make sure that budget allocation already in line with the uh, national planning uh, uh, document. And when we ask the data from Minister of Finance, instead of getting the data that will be ready to be operated, meaning the data that can be analyzed easily, they give us the hard copy, you know, the data in hard copy, not in hard copy in terms of, you know, on the paper, but in PDF style. You know, in PDF style, you cannot do the data analysis right away. You have to re-entry the data into your, uh, for example, your Excel before you can do any analysis. So this very simple, simple example that the data is not yet interoperable among uh, agencies. So this is part of improving data governance. The other part, of course, opening data release and utilization by publication of data in open format. You know, so the ideal thing is every uh, citizens that is taxpayer basically, because we know that uh, the government can operate because of tax revenue. And who is paying tax? The taxpayers. Taxpayer is basically the citizen. So the ideal thing, citizen can access all the budget, government budget, uh, especially on the expenditure side. So they know that their tax will be used, for example, building certain kilometers of road, <coughs> building how many hospitals, building a certain number of schools. So it has to be in open format and easily accessible by every citizen.
So we have to have one data portal development and encouraging the use of data, both internal and public. So this is the heart of why one data policy is important to make sure that Indonesia and of course other countries will be moving to the open government uh, society. And since we are in the industrial revolution 4.0, and I already mentioned the importance of AI in the e-government system, then uh, our ministry already released the national strategy for artificial intelligence. So the idea is to integrating public service and business productivities for investment in resources and encouragement of innovation in various sectors. So this is the example of data utilization and optimization if we can use the artificial intelligence. Since we have, you know, of course, many things to do, we need to prioritize. So our AI strategy will be prioritized to five areas that we think will be relevant to the life of Indonesian people. Number one, health service, especially for supporting the telemedicine. You know, the COVID pandemic, I think, already cut the number of people going to the hospital. But people still sometimes need to go to hospital, at least consulting with the doctor. So one alternative way, not going to the hospital, but still consulting with your doctors, is through telemedicine. And artificial intelligence will play a significant role in making sure the consultation will be happening as if you are meeting the doctors in front of you physically. So this is number one. Number two is the one that we are just discussing, the bureaucratic reform, which is the e-government. So the president has ideas. Whenever we do the government reform, bureaucracy reform, cannot be done only using the human being. The bureaucratic reform can only be done if we use artificial intelligence to support the human activities. That's the only way to create efficiency in bureaucracy. Third, education and research. Of course, education in the future will be hybrid, offline and online. And of course, we have to make the artificial intelligence really working to support any education activities as well as research. Uh, there will be more and more uh, research on the area of artificial intelligence. In fact, in Indonesia, we just uh, you know, had the new innovation called breathalyzer. Breathalyzer is the way to detect people with COVID. And the, the way they detect the COVID is through the breath. And why the breath? Because the breath has a certain uh, a certain element called volatile organic compound that can be analyzed using artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence can tell if this certain people, certain individual has been, detect, has been detected with COVID or not with, this, with the help of artificial intelligence. So this is the result, the result, uh, the result of the research activities. Number four is food security. I think it's quite clear. It's about smart agriculture. The current agriculture doesn't have to be manual. It has to be supported with technology, not just agriculture technology, with digital technology, with artificial intelligence. So even though you have big area of, let's say, plantation, you can identify which trees that in the good condition which trees is ready to be harvested, which trees are still problem or having some kind of disease, for example. So this is the area that now can be done, especially with the help of drone. So you don't have to worry if you have large area of plantation. You can use the drone to monitor by the support of artificial intelligence. And number five is mobility and smart cities. We know that the, the world is more urbanized. More and more people living in urban area. In Indonesia, already more than 50%. So the way to manage the cities are no longer by using the traditional way, using just regulation, using just the government official. 
you have to use the smart city approach. Everything will be connected digitally, and artificial intelligence will help. For example, to to solve the traffic congestion, to help management of public transportation. So it doesn't have to be uh, based on the decision of a certain uh, top rank official. It can be done automatically by artificial intelligence, as long as all the data have been collected. So after that, uh, we make the roadmap for government big data and analytics with some government initiatives like standardization of big data system and then national data center building that hopefully could be completed in 2024, you know, as a source of cloud computing and research and continuous research of development, research and development of big data technology. Because we know this big data is like the, the future gold mine. We have to really capitalize on the availability of big data for many things. We can use it not only for commercial things, but also for the development of research and development of the new system that helps people in the future. So we have the we have already set up the roadmap. So by 2024, we already have data architecture management and we already can do the monitoring and evaluation. Prior to that, of course, we do all the preparation, especially to break out the silo among the ministries and agencies in uh, Indonesia. And of course, to support data integration and setting up all the infrastructure uh, needed. And in our digital transformation development 2020-2024, which is the term of current government, first thing first, we have to build the infrastructure. We know the importance of big data, we know the importance of artificial intelligence, but we have to go to the basic. And the basic is digital technology. Digital technology needs infrastructure called the infrastructure uh, of telecommunication, the ICT. And the ICT, first, we have to expand the broadband. Or Indonesia already completed what we call Palaparing as the backbone of connection. But now we are going for the last miles. And Indonesia, of course, very big countries, and we would like to reach not only every village, every region, but also every household. Satellite plus fiber optic plus BTS, I think will be an integrated system that will be very much needed in Indonesia. And then we are going to push for the e-government as well as infrastructure inter integration. This is the part of the big, big data, uh, sorry, one data policy that I just mentioned. And then we would like to utilize the ICT infrastructure for some prioritized sector like education, health, and also agriculture and smart cities. So the infrastructure is there, but we want to make sure the infrastructure will be very much utilized for uh, priorities that uh, benefited by majority of the people. And then, of course, we have to strengthen the digital human resources, strengthen the domestic industry. Since Indonesia is quite big economy, we don't want to be just a market, the market of the ICT, the market of all the artificial intelligence. We want to build our own domestic industry capability. Of course, cannot be majority in the beginning, but we are going step by step until we really uh, understand about the technology and we can produce the technology itself. And of course, to support that, we need strong technology adoption. And we are going to focus on two things, big data and IoT. Because IoT can produce big data. But so IoT will come first, and after that, we can produce big data. And after that, the artificial intelligence that will use big data for doing uh, so many type of uh, analysis. And of course, at the end, we want to create the smart governance. And smart governance will be very much different with the concept of good governance in the past. The smart governance here, we are trying to strengthen the less contact economy and less contact society. So even though we don't meet each other, doesn't mean that good governance is not there. Good governance is not just about physical contact. Good governance is about the information that 
this open information that is accountable. And it can be done by promoting less contact economy and less contact society. So things that we have done during the pandemic actually helps, helping to accelerate digital transformation and helping us to learn and to be adjusted to the less contact economy. And we know that human activities are carried out through certain application programs to minimize the direct contact. So that's why the IoT is important. Digital industry is important to make sure less contact economy can be done smoothly. And less contact economy, less contact society needs to get supported by application with capable internet and telecommunication network. The infrastructure, the basic infrastructure of ICT has to be there. So there are two major requirements for smart governance. The basic infrastructure of ICT and the generation and, and the, the use of application that will help human activities to do their activities without uh, losing the productivity because people do not, do not want to lose their productivity. They want to keep their productivity, but they have to do it now with less contact and with the help of the digital technology. So I think that will be hopefully the sharing that can be shared to you. Of course, part of that is Indonesian experience, meaning that something that has been done in Indonesia, but the other would be our dream or our vision about Indonesia in the future that will, of course, include the smart governance. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll, uh, I, I give back the program to the, to the moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Excellen Excellency, for such a very detailed and uh, comprehensive presentation with uh, vivid uh, examples uh, covering uh, key prerequisites and approach and processes in the Indonesian experience. Um, uh, we will now move on to the uh, Q&A session. And I'm aware that Your Excellency will be with us for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, so in order to um, in order to proceed very quickly uh, to the questions, I think some questions are already coming in, Your Excellency. If you do want to raise a question, you can raise your hand or you can type in your name and agency in the, in the chat and uh, I, I will get back to you. Uh, the first question, Your Excellency, is uh, if you could give some specific use case of the application of AI in any of the fields you, you mentioned or something which uh, Indonesia is planning to implement, either in governance or in health or in education. Yeah. Yeah. I think to answer the first question, uh, maybe one example that already uh, part of my presentation is what the hell, how we can use the artificial intelligence to do some kind of analysis or kind of uh, health uh, analysis of uh, individual. So for example, I already mentioned about the breathalyzer, which is uh, I think original innovation from Indonesia by one of the uni our universities in which they use the AI to detect people with COVID-19. And the way to detect people COVID with COVID-19 is through their breath that contains the volatile organic compound. So volatile organic compound has specific character that can be identified by the AI. And the good thing about AI, because this is machine learning, Whenever they have more and more data, meaning more and more people that have already uh, give their breath for, uh, to be analyzed by the device, then the AI can uh, make more accurate uh, prediction about whether somebody uh, detected with COVID-19 or not. So this is one for the health. The other still related to the health because of the pandemic, we are now trying to use AI for detecting uh, COVID-19 using the big data coming from the X-ray. So from the X-ray uh, uh, analysis, the artificial intelligence will try to detect whether 
people with this X-ray, you know, with data X-ray, has been infected with COVID or not, or whether it could be it could lead to COVID-19 or not. So this example of this uh, for the uh, health. For others, I think more in the urban areas. So there are now uh, traffic management or uh, also flood management using uh, artificial intelligence. So meaning that whenever there is a problem with the, with the traffic, then the artificial intelligence will tell us, you know, uh, how we can give the alternative routes to every uh, every everybody uh, using the vehicles. So it means with the data that can be uh, can be shared through the cell phone, they can identify oh this area is congested. So why don't you use other uh, other routes in order to uh, uh, reach to your destination? So this is in the area of uh, urban area, I mean urban area. I think there are more application, I think in agriculture. In agriculture now in Indonesia, the, the, the plantation management now can be done by artificial intelligence. They use the drone that equipped with artificial intelligence to detect whether these certain, let's say trees already ready to be harvested. This, Trees maybe needs to be treated because they have a specific disease, or this area maybe has to be cut out because it has been uh, less productive. So there are a couple examples for education. Uh, I think now uh, there are more and more startup in education in Indonesia, and part of the technology that used by the startup is using the artificial intelligence. Using artificial intelligence to try to solve the math problems or any science uh, problem uh, using the uh, artificial intelligence. So those are the simple cases in which AI has been used, but of course, we have to admit, it's still far from the optimal. I mean, we can do more, but of course, we need more time to do that. My uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, next, uh, we do have somebody, I think, who wants to come in with a comment. So I'm going to give you the uh, floor next. And this is uh, Dawa Penjo from New Brunswick University. But uh, before I give the mic to Dawa Penjo, I also just wanted to flag the next question that has been raised, Your Excellency. Uh, and this is from Kado Zampo from the Department of Local Governance on whether Indonesia has done any return on investment analysis on any of the apps that were launched and whether there has been any cost savings. Uh, so to repeat, uh, the first I will give the floor to Doji Pedro for his, uh, Dao Pedro, I'm sorry, from New Brunswick University and that will be followed by the question which I just raised your excellency. So Dao, you have the floor. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, excuse me if the audio quality is poor, but uh, what I wanted to ask was a question, if possible. Please, please go ahead, Ladawa. Keep your question uh, brief and to the point. No? Ah, yes. Uh, so, uh, for, I, I, uh, I, I do apologize if this is a too general of a question, but I was hoping that His Excellency could answer this question, which is, uh, how do you get people to accept this, uh, you know, move towards technology, especially given the generation and rural slash urban divide, if that makes sense? Because right now we have older generations that aren't so accustomed to technology. And even within the same generation, we have people in rural areas and we have people in urban areas. So it seems like there's this huge gap between individuals, yet we're trying to make everyone integrate into the same system. So how do you get everyone on board? Okay. Uh, 
Indonesia is quite lucky because now we are experiencing the so-called demographic dividend in which majority of population now is younger generation. So, of course, the acceptance or adoption to the new technology will be easier. But you are right to mention that there will be a big gap between the older generation and younger generation. So, especially in the rural areas or in the agriculture areas or uh, areas that will have a lot of fishermen, for example, the keyword to make people more adaptive and accept the new technology is benefit. So if you can show the benefit of new technology without you know, getting too much hassle, you will have people accepting and even asking for the technology itself. So why benefit is important? Of course, at the end of the day, the use of technology is to help the life of the people. As I mentioned, with the less contact economy, actually you don't have to reduce your productivity, but you can be more efficient. So in the case of the, let's say, new technology in the agriculture. So let me give you one very simple example in Indonesia that could also apply to many developing countries in the world. So in the traditional way, if a farmer in Indonesia they, you know, when they have the harvesting season, of course they are happy because they can, you know, sell their products. The problem when they sell the products because of the distance between the farmers and of course the, the final consumer, which is let's say the, the urban people, then the farmers have to sell to the intermediaries, to the, the intermediaries and that there will be more than one intermediary. That's why I call intermediaries. So the, the chain of the, of the agriculture sales is quite long from the farmers to the final customers. As a result, the price of the, in the farmers will be low. The farmers will, will be poor, while at the other end, at the final consumer, the price will be high. Which, which can create the inflation. So what happened in the middle? The middle, the middlemen or the intermediaries are the ones that take a big chunk of this uh, uh, value chain of the agriculture product. This is what happened if you are not adopting digital technology. With the adoption of technology, especially digital technology, using your cell phone, and don't forget in Indonesia, the penetration of cell phone is very high, 100%, meaning that we can assume everyone in Indonesia has at least one cell phone because the penetration is 100%. So with the help of cell phone and with the help of application, now the farmers or the fishermen can sell their products when they do that, when they are in harvesting session, to the final buyers. How? Using the digital technology, using the marketplace that has been developed by you know, some uh, startup. So this is a good solution because at the end, the farmers and fishermen will be not poor anymore. They can get higher revenue while the final customers will enjoy a lower price. So inflation will also be relatively small. So this is the, the beauty of technology, and everybody gets a benefit. Who don't get the benefit? The intermediaries. But intermediaries are not necessarily have to be there. You know, they don't, they don't have to exist. If we can shortcut the, the, the sales, the sales of the agriculture product into the wholesaler or directly into retailer. So this is the benefit, and by introducing the benefit, I believe everybody will accept. Even though they are older generation, but they can ask the younger generation to help them using their cell phone in order to access the application, in order to access the market platform. I think that would be my response. Sorry, what is the last question? I forgot the last um, question. 
whether there, uh, whether there's been some analysis done on the investment returns and whether it's cost saving adoption of technology rolling out of oh. application yeah yeah uh, i think uh, i don't know about the kind of comprehensive study about that but uh, in anecdotal cases i think there has been some comparison between uh, using technology and non using the technology and certainly i i i believe very much that the existence of technology especially now the digital technology already creates the efficiencies and certainly uh, doing the cost cutting i think the example that i just raised about how uh, farmers can sell their product directly to the to the final retailer for example already create economic efficiency compared to if they sell the product with using the traditional ways. So I believe that will be a good example. And in manufacturing industry, it's quite clear. The automation, although of course at the cost of uh, losing some employees, but certainly automation can create much efficiency and a cost saving compared to do uh, manufacturing using the uh, manual uh, labor. So I think uh, some examples are quite clear showing that uh, adoption of technology will help in uh, creating more efficient economy. Well, thank you, Excellency. I, I believe we have time for just one last question. And uh, I wanted to refer to a question from the our DG from the Tourism Council. Uh, this is about the impact of AI uh, on reducing complacency of individuals. And I would also actually add uh, in terms of the impact of AI on uh, jobs as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, especially AI, might create uh, some kind of threat to the job creation. And in fact, there could be job loss because of the existence of AI. But remember, job loss is not the same with unemployment. So unemployment happens because you have the job, but somehow somebody else is uh, more appropriate to be in your position, so you lost your job. Okay, that's unemployment. Job loss is because your job is disappearing because of the technology substituting your job. So in this case, of course, AI could create the threat. But remember, AI can also create efficiency. In economy, once you create efficiency, then your economic growth will be higher. Once your economic growth will be higher, this economic growth will create new jobs. It means there will be new jobs created somewhere, yeah, then, or even higher than the number of job loss. And of course, from human resources point of view, uh, when you are talking about human resource management, you need to prepare people with uh, higher skills and people that involved in the jobs that still needs human tasks. There are certain people, uh, certain job categories that will not disappear because of artificial intelligence. One of them in education, which is teacher. I don't think anybody here, at least in this webinar, will be happy if your teacher is a robot and then using artificial intelligence to deliver the lecture. I think still people like to, at least to see the human being delivering the lecture. And people like to see a medical doctor delivering their uh, treatment for uh, any uh, disease. So there are still many type of jobs that will not be disappeared because of the because of the artificial intelligence. But yes, the job with certain routinity, the jobs that will not have any variation will simply disappear because of artificial intelligence. But again, artificial intelligence will create efficiency. Efficiency will 
be leading to higher economic growth. Higher economic growth will lead to the higher job generation or job creation. So at the end of the day, there could be some worry about job loss, but the new jobs, and don't forget, there will be new job creation because of the new uh, technology. For example, now, when you are talking about the pilot, you are talking about pilot of the real airplane or the pilot of the jet fighter, for example, for military purpose. But now you have new, uh, new jobs called drone pilots. And they have to be as skillful as the real pilot. But of course, it creates new jobs because I'm not talking, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm in, I, I'm in favor of any war, of course. But if we are talking about any potential military conflict in the future, they will not send the jet fighter to solve the problem. They will send the drone. And the drone has to be piloted by a skillful drone pilot. So this is one example. And also drone pilot will be useful to help, uh, let's say, uh, treat, uh, man maintain the agriculture fields or the plantation. So that's kind of example that uh, AI should not create too much work, uh, too much concern about the job loss. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. I, I, I do want to thank uh, Your Excellency, especially for highlighting uh, what I've what we've understood as the two, uh, I think, building blocks. Uh, one being data and data that is accurate, open and interoperable. And second uh, being our digital HR. Your Excellency, you have raised a lot of issues which we are all too familiar with in Bhutan. I think the key question that we have to honestly tackle here is how serious we are about uh, the state of our data and how serious we are about addressing uh, uh, this, this issue. Uh, Your Excellency, the presentation was very clear and very succinct on a topic that is very wide very complex and sometimes for us quite abstract as well. So I do want to once again, thank your excellency. Uh, I know your excellency is very busy to have devoted a whole hour uh, for us uh, today in this inaugural session of the uh, virtual seminar. And uh, we hope your excellency that we can continue uh, this dialogue. And we also look forward to exploring further uh, potential collaboration and knowledge sharing. Thank you, thank you very much, your excellency. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, so that brings us uh, to the uh, end of the presentation from His Excellency, uh, who has unfortunately had to leave. Uh, but uh, for all of you or any of you who have the time and are interested, we can still continue this conversation uh, we will, I think we are off Facebook now, but uh, we can continue with the Zoom uh, conference. So if there's um, any other thoughts or questions, uh, questions not to me, uh, questions which anybody else can answer, I suppose, or maybe any interventions, uh, I would just like to inform that uh, we can uh, uh, go on depending on everybody's interest and availability. And we can follow the same formats, like if you do want to intervene or uh, share your thoughts. Uh, uh, you can put in your name. So we've got uh, Sangeet Chedupla, SD uh, Cryogenic Gases Private Limited. Uh, did you want to come in? Uh, Uh, at this point, um, I may request uh, Dasho Urala uh, if uh, Dasho would like to share uh, anything. Dashu has to unmute your mic, Dashu. Yes, Allah. 
So I I like to thank uh, all of you I, for making these afternoons uh, uh, gatherings very fruitful and very uh, rich. Um, the minister was really good, uh, giving us overarching uh, picture of uh, what AIN in the governance means. So I think uh, there are lots of uh, high officials uh, who are taking this uh, uh, topic far uh, more professionally and seriously in terms of implementation than CBS. So I like to request others to uh, others to participate in some uh, sort of uh, reflection on what the minister uh, shared with us today. Uh, I have, um, as he went along, uh, summarized uh, his talk, and that will be available if you need. Please just drop a word to me. I will send this <clears throat> uh, 21 points he, uh, I thought he mentioned, but Ami Yangchin also would have a separate uh, separate uh, list of uh, important things he said. So thank you very much. I don't have anything. I, I thought it was... Uh, 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 excellent, uh, excellent and practical uh, oriented presentation. I see Jimmy is also there. So Jimmy Tenzin uh, from our um, Ministry of Communication. So please uh, discuss amongst yourself. La. Uh, last, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shah. Uh, um, and uh, thank you very much La, for summarizing uh, the points. I have been taking points notes diligently as well. And if the audience would like, we will compile all of this together and uh, share it. La. And I don't know whether we have permission to share the PowerPoints. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back on that. Is there somebody who right. wants to come in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, okay, so I believe uh, we've got uh, Madam Son Belgian Hai, the RM director. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my question is actually uh, directed to the director, the ITT, Jim uh, Tenzin. I'm, I'm aware that uh, the DITT has been working on the platforms for, for something like the smart government for a long time. Um, especially with regard to interoperability and the electronic signature. And uh, the Indonesian minister uh, under the smart, uh, smart government architecture, he specifically mentioned seven uh, platforms. I was just wondering whether you could uh, inform the group today how different or how similar it is to the plans that you have in DITT and how are we progressing so far? Thank you very much. So, uh, Jigmila, are you there? La? Are you able to connect? Maybe some connectivity issues. Uh, but, uh, Madam, we'll make sure uh, that we convey the question if he's, if he's having difficulty. Otherwise, I'm also aware that there are also representation from DITT, some uh, very senior officers from DITT, maybe they can also take the time to uh, give us some, uh, you know, uh, information on this. Do we have anyone la, from the ITT? La? Yokala. Uh, so, uh, Madam Sonam, either they're having some connectivity issues or they're not really ready to present, share anything, but um, I, will, I do promise that um, I think if there is a demand on this, uh, maybe we can request uh, DITT uh, for a follow-up presentation or whatever on this. I, I don't see anyone from DITT raising their hand. Lasta, is there anyone else that would like to intervene? Uh, 
Um, so we will be um, we will be sharing uh, the PowerPoint as well. Uh, most likely, we will upload it on the CBS uh, uh, website. Now. So you can, uh, I think, uh, take it uh, from there that within a few days, we will upload it. Um, with that, oh, it has Jimmy come in? Uh, not yet. Uh, the screen that we're see, seeing is, uh, I think, some connectivity issue Mela, from, the, from the DITT. I'm not sure if you're trying to speak, Leti, but um, we can't hear anything. Otherwise, uh, whoever is manning the DITT uh, portion, you can also uh, type in uh, your reaction in the chat if you're having audio issues, or audio or video issues. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also really happy to uh, just inform uh, everyone that um, the series is going to continue. And if uh, you do have, uh, I think, areas uh, there that you would like us to feature uh, on this series, we would be more than welcome. Uh, welcome that. I think we'll put out more information uh, through the web uh, through the website on how you can reach out uh, to Shishankar. Uh, in terms of the uh, possible topics and the space that you would like to see uh, being discussed uh, uh, through this uh, virtual uh, seminar. Uh, the next uh, uh, seminar is uh, next week, Lola, at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, uh, with Dr. Nagraha, I think that's correct, uh, the director of Jakarta Smart City, uh, who will be touching on issues ranging from biometrics for, use, uh, for civil service attendance, uh, to using AI to solve traffic issues, to lifelong literacy and learning, and to urban planning. It sounds like a very exciting uh, seminar lined up there. We do hope uh, to see uh, participation. Uh, so that's uh, next week, next week meaning do we have Thursday, Thursday, Thursday uh, at uh, 2 p.m. So if there are no more uh, uh, comments or interventions, I would like to thank everyone for your participation. I apologize, we couldn't go through everyone's questions uh, uh, since the uh, Honorable Minister had to had some prior uh, engagements uh, after three. Uh, but uh, once again, on behalf of uh, Shi Jenkar, uh, CBS, uh, thank you, everyone, for taking time to join us uh, at, in the inauguration of this very, very exciting very timely, uh, timely uh, seminar on the use of AI and innovative uh, solutions for good governance. Last one, Karishel.